in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> you know, when I was learning how to preach in seminary, our pr professor made sure that he would video record our very first sermon. And then he'd send us the video file for us to review, and then we had to write a, we had to do a write-up of what we believed went right with the sermon and the things that we needed to work on. And I'll be honest, that was one of the most humbling experiences of seminary, uh, if not my life. That first video was terrible. I almost wanted to show it to you today, but I think I'd probably die of embarrassment. <laughs> um, I hope that I've gotten a little better, and I know there's a lot of room for growth. And I bring this up because as I was, I was reflecting on today's passage, uh, I felt so green, as green as I felt in that first sermon. Because in this passage, we have Jesus, the Lord, the Master himself, preaching. And I have to preach to you today on a much better sermon found in Scripture. I mean, you have to look at it. Jesus is, you know, he's at his local church. He's at a synagogue, and instead of giving this long sermon, he gives a sermon that's only one sentence long. And I bet some of you wish that today I was imitating Jesus on this point. If only I could be that concise. So let's get into today's passage. What does Jesus say here in his sermon? Let me give you the reason why it's so short. He says, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, which means, I am he. I have come. I am here. I am the sermon. My life is the sermon. And that's all you need to know. That's his sermon. And you have to wonder, how did his original hearers respond to Jesus' sermon? And that's a cliffhanger for next week. So Stephen's going to take care of that. But I'll give you a heads up, their reaction is insane. But that's next week. We're here today with Jesus preaching and proclaiming the gospel to us right now. He's here right now. And the question is, what is your response to his sermon? What is your response to the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, we all have a response to Jesus' sermon. He's saying to you, I'm here right now. I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the one you need. I know that you're looking for deep satisfaction in your career or in your romance or in your family life or your reputation or your finances, right? Your hopes for the future. But what you're actually looking for is me. How are you responding to me personally? He's asking you. You know what's cool about Jesus' sermon recorded here in Luke is that Jesus knows his Bible. And so he reads Isaiah 61 and he knows that it's all about him. And he's telling us what he's about. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Pause. Who are the poor? He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There is a lot to unpack here. It's a rich passage, and I can't do it all today. But what is clear is that Jesus is giving us the good news, the gospel, and are we receiving it? Or let me ask it this way. What's the condition to receive the gospel based on this reading? Jesus says, to bring good news to the poor, the poor. You could say, oh, oh gosh, Seth, uh, I'm doing okay, I'm not rich, but I highly doubt that I can describe myself as poor. Is the good news not for me? You know, you know that's a good question. Let me say three things today to help you understand how the gospel is for you and for me. Number one, the gospel is only for the spiritually poor. Number two, the gospel is especially for the actually poor. And number three, the gospel will come into your life and transform you only if you're willing to be both. All right, the gospel is only for the spiritually poor. poor. Let's do that. Jesus comes only for the spiritually poor. And you could say, but Seth, he says poor. He doesn't say spiritually poor. Why are you saying that? 
I'm bringing it up because a little later in chapter 4, so if you read past verse 21, which we read, Jesus uses two Old Testament examples as types of people that are able to receive God. He mentions the poor widow and Naaman, Naaman the general. So if Jesus is saying in today's passage, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, we might think, yeah, okay, the widow is super poor, that makes sense. But Naaman, he is super rich. What then does it mean to be poor? It means spiritual poverty. The widow and Naaman are both outsiders, right? They're Gentiles, they're heretics, they're idol worshippers. They're not part of the people of God. Yet if you read their stories in the Old Testament, you'll see that they acknowledge their complete need of God. Jesus doesn't say that he comes also for the outsiders. Jesus comes only for people like them. Are you spiritually poor? Or are you spiritually middle class? Spiritually middle class. You might think I'm being a little facetious there. And I am, only a little bit. You know, I think that most of us here work around middle class social strata. And I think that's a fair assumption. And I think that can trip us up if we import a middle class ethic into our spirituality. Because you have to be spiritually poor to receive the gospel. But some of us, and I'm, I'm definitely including myself, are actually spiritually middle class. And that's not going to do. Now, Seth, what do you mean by spiritually middle class? Well, let me give you two ways that you can identify a spiritual middle classness. Number one, listen, you, you, do a lot of, you do all the Christian things. You go to church regularly, you read scripture, you, uh, you tithe, you give to the church, you volunteer in the church, maybe you're volunteering outside. You're doing all the things that a Christian should do. And then when your life doesn't go the way you planned, when God doesn't act the way you think he should act in your life, you lose it. You get angry or you get depressed. You struggle or you lose your faith in God. And that's happening because you have a middle class spirituality, right? Because what do you do? You work, you put your hours in, you expect a wage. And then you bring that mentality to God. Look, I'm doing all these good things. I'm going to church. I'm reading your Bible. Now that I've done all your things, you owe me a good life. Right? Underneath that religious veneer is actually a hostility towards God. In my life, I notice it because it, it comes up in my prayer life. It may come up in your prayer life too. It goes something like this. God, why isn't my life as good as so-and-so? Look, I've been praying. I've been reading the Bible. I'm doing all the Christian things. Now, those are you, you will have your own words, right? Those aren't your exact words, but they could be the, the theme in your prayer life. And if that's the case, I'm going to strongly suggest that you stop because when you're doing that, you're actually trying to be God. You're trying to make God your servant. You're actually rebelling through obedience. And the signature sign of this is anger. A frustrated, hostile posture towards God because you're not getting what you deserve. Here's another way of identifying spiritual middle classness. You hate the mention of outcasts. You can't stand foreigners. You resent the very mention of the poor. You don't like their presence. You feel uncomfortable when they're around. And if they do come around, you feel uncomfortable, but you also feel superior to them. Okay, I've given you a rough description of middle class spirituality, but you can say, Seth, okay, what does it look like to be spiritually poor? Define that. I'll just give you two. Two ways of seeing what it looks like to be spiritually poor. One is that you look underneath the surface of your actions and you see your motives, right? If you were to talk about your life, you would say something like this, yes, there have been times I obeyed God, and there were times when I clearly didn't. And I didn't obey God because I just didn't want his hands in my life. I didn't want to be under God's authority. My good behavior was a way to get God in my debt, to have my way. I wanted to be able to say to God, look at all these good things I've done. I've earned a good life. I want it to be my own Lord, my own Savior. Because, my friends, it's easy to look at the surface of your life and just say, yeah, I did all those good things because I'm a good person and I do good things, and that's what matters, right? 
but a spiritually poor person looks underneath the surface and speaks the truth about our motives and recognizes that often they're not good. Another way to identify spiritual poverty is that you understand and you say, I can only be saved through a gift. God's salvation is a complete gift. It's absolute mercy. God, if you want me out of your family, that's completely up to you, but please give me salvation because what your son has done for me. It's a complete gift. Not because you're a good person, not because all that matters is that you do good things, none of that. If you come to God with something, if you say to God, listen, I've been really trying, I'm working really hard, please come into my life, look, I'm trying, look, I'm being so good, I'm trying to clean up my life, I'm being a good person, you are coming to God middle class. You haven't come poor. The gospel is especially for the actually poor. If you look at the Bible over and over again, we see God identifying with the actual poor. When you see in the Bible there's a, pers a poor person next to a rich person, or you see a woman next to a man, or you see a racial outsider next to a racial insider, it's always the person without power who gets it, who understands God's message. For example, if you look at the Bible, there are eight resurrections, eight miracles of God, and seven of the eight times it's women who receive the ones back from the dead. Look at the biblical pattern. You have a little slave girl who understands where God is, not Naaman the mighty general. Or if you read Luke, Luke 7, you have a fallen woman who understands who Jesus is, not the proud religious leader. Why? Because God has set it up so that the powerful don't understand the gospel as a general rule. And the more you're pushed out into the margins, the more likely you are to understand the message of God's salvation when you hear it. Now this is important, so I've got to be careful here. I am not saying that the poor have less sin than the rich. I am not saying that. But what is the doctrine of grace? The doctrine of grace is you're only saved by losing power by a savior who lost power. And Jesus actually shows this by his reading of Isaiah 61. And you see when he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And he ends that passage to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, period. Right? Because if you read Luke, after the word favor, there's a period, the end of the sentence which will actually stand out because if you go to Isaiah 61, you'll learn that Jesus is stopping mid-sentence. And he isn't making a mistake. He is doing it deliberately. Do you know what comes next after the word favor? And the day of vengeance of our God. In Isaiah 61, the servant of the Lord will bring the year of the Lord's favor and the year of the Lord's vengeance. What Jesus is saying is, I'll bring that vengeance, but not at this coming. At this coming, I've come to receive judgment, not send it. I've come not with a sword in my hand, but with nails in my hands. So in Jesus, we have a Savior who said, I am going to save the world through a loss of power. I am going to save the world by losing. I'm going to save the world by being tortured and dying for the sins of the world. And if you have a middle-class spirituality, you won't understand that because a middle-class spirituality is ultimately about power. Because you think, oh, if I pull myself together and if I'm very strong and if I have self-control and if I have willpower and if I do everything right and if I can summon up enough power, God will give me power. And Jesus says, no, I am sorry. The gospel is all about the opposite. I saved the world through a completely loss of power. Therefore, you can only receive my salvation by giving up all claim, by being spiritually poor, by giving up all power and surrendering. Then you will find that you're so filled with my love and my acceptance that you can give away the rest of your life and see people changed by you giving up your anger, by giving up your money for other people, by not lording it over them, but becoming a servant. You know, a while back, there was this famous white preacher who gave a talk at a large convention of American black ministers. This is in the United States. And they appreciated him coming out. But one of the things that he said 
was, isn't it great we live in a nation where if you come to this nation really poor and you work really hard, you can become rich? Well, his ancestors were Scottish. And all the black ministers essentially were responding, well, that's interesting, because our ancestors came to this country at pretty much the same time as your ancestors, and we worked a lot harder, 20 hours a day under the lash. And we worked harder than your ancestors. Gee, somehow we're not rich. And the point of that anecdote is, it, is that if you've made it to the top, or if you're succeeding in your life, you will certainly tell yourself, I did it all through hard work and through savvy. However, people who have not made it to the top realize it's way more complex than that. The truth is, the people who have made it to the top have gotten there through grace. Yet people on the inside, they're going to say, yeah, you've got to live through works, so you've got to work hard. But the people who are on the outside always know they're there through grace. Therefore, along comes the gospel of Jesus, and he says, you're spiritually poor. And if you don't admit that, you can't know my salvation. You must live lives of sacrifice. You have nothing to merit salvation. You have to admit that you're an abject sinner. And if you don't like that, it's probably because you think that what you have is due to your hard work and savvy when it's actually due to grace. It's just due to the fact that God has made it possible. You know, people on the margins, they understand that intuitively. People on the inside almost never do. I mean, just look through the history of the world, and you'll see ethnic minorities understand and grasp the gospel before the majorities and the dominant. Women before men, poor before rich, over and over again. You know it's true. And do you know what's amazing to me? You'll have folks who will look at all the churches around the world, and they see women more than men, and they see more poor than rich, and they see more minorities than dominant, and do you know what they say? Oh, that means it's not true. The Bible says that means it is true. So, so far, we've seen that the gospel is only for the spiritually poor, and the gospel is especially for the actually poor. Finally, we must recognize that the gospel comes through only those who are willing to be both. If you want to understand the gospel, if you want the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to move through your life, you have to be willing to be spiritually poor and actually poor. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you have to look at Jesus. He came to earth, and he became Joseph and Mary's son, and they were dirt poor. When you, look, when you look at his parents bringing Jesus to the temple to be circumcised, they, their offering to the temple was two pigeons. That means that they were at the complete bottom of the social scale. Heaven's son became the son of Mary and Joseph. He lit, Jesus had all the wealth and all the power, and he gave it up. He emptied himself. That's the only way he could bring you the gospel. And do you know what that means? You have to be spiritually poor to receive the Spirit. But once you receive the Spirit, what does it say? The Spirit of the Lord is on me to proclaim the good news to the poor. What that means is the way you know you really have become spiritually poor and that you've received the gospel of Jesus is you become radically generous. Now, it's not that you become literally poor, and I want to be careful there because I am not saying that. Listen, God wants us, he wants us to help the poor, and he, he thinks that it's tough to be poor, and he thinks it's awful not to provide for your family, so he's not advocating for you to become literally poor. But what is then being said here? This. What he's calling us to do is to lower our lifestyle and to begin giving so radically of our finances that other people in our social class will think we have lost our minds. They will think, by their standards, we are living poor. If you are giving financially in such a way that folks in your social class knew how much you were giving and they thought you were completely nuts, then you have begun to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. If you understand the gospel, it will make you radically generous. And if you don't find yourself every year giving more and more money, or at least finding it easier to give it away, that is a sure sign that you're not growing in the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you might say, 
as my heart is definitely saying, boy, that's going to be hard. And that's okay. And some of you might say, again, like my heart is saying, that is scary. Do you realize the things I wouldn't be able to do if I did that? And my question is, why is it so scary? I'll tell you why I think it's scary. Because you may say you believe in Jesus is your savior, that he is your significance, that he is your security, but actually your money is. Your money is your significance. Your money is your security. Do you know the great thing about the gospel? Is that it turns your money into just money. It just becomes money. Then it's easy to give away. It's not who you are anymore. It's not the foundation of your peace. Right? Because you may say, I believe in Jesus, but functionally, he is not your significance and not your security. Therefore, what does the gospel do? It takes that away, and it makes money just money. Okay, so what are you supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Let me end with a suggestion. Let me make it practical. If St. Matthew's is your home, and I'm not saying, by the way, that the church should get all your money. I'm not trying to say that. I know some of you guys are just waiting for the knife. Give me all your cash. I am not, I am not saying that. But here's what I want you to consider. The Bible talks 20 times more about money than it does about sex. About 30 times more. God must mean that greed is far more spiritually dangerous to you than sexual impropriety. Or he wouldn't talk about it 20 to 30 times more. So I'm going to invite you to look at your attitude towards money. Even more practically speaking, I'm going to encourage you to check out our church website, especially our section on giving. We've put up some handy information on what it can look like for your family to give depending on how much money you're making. My friends, this is a tough sermon to give, trust me. And when I was preparing for it, it comes at the middle of my wife and I having to have really testy discussions about money. How much do we give? What does our family look like? It's scary. And when, I was, when we were talking and thinking about it, I saw my own heart. I saw, yep, there's that middle class spirituality. It's right there, Seth, in your heart. Because I know that my wife has had, a, has had a hard life. And I know that I have too. And then we've come together and there's goodness there. But life, you guys know, like every day, it can be hard sometimes. And there's my heart saying, okay, it's really hard. Well, I'm going to get mine. And I'm just not going to give as much. I'm going to give less because that money, I need that. I see it in my own life. And I have to repent about that. I'm like, God, you come from the spiritually poor, but I'm acting very middle class right now. Because I'm like, oh, I work at a church. I'm a super Christian. I should have a good life. And God's like, no, remember, I'm God, not you. I'm like, you're right. You are right. And you repent. And I have to live into what Jesus is saying there, what Jesus has lived, his emptying, then I have to give back. This, my money is not who I am here. I have to learn to give. We have to learn to give. Church, do you hear what I'm saying? The gospel is only for the spiritually poor. The gospel is especially for the actually poor. And the gospel comes through only those who are willing to be both. Is that you? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, I am so grateful and we are so grateful that you love us with an infinite love. And though you see our hearts and you see the way we're trying to love you and follow you, but you also see the, the, greed, is, the greed and the insecurity and the unwillingness to trust you, you see all that, but you love us all the way through, all the way down. And we are so grateful. And God, I pray that you help us really take to heart the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and your gospel, and that we may love others and be generous the way you would have us live our lives in generosity. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our service will continue on page four in your service bulletin. Let us stand.